Hey there, it's Olivia Savannah here from Olivia's Catastrophe and today I'm here to give you part two of my April wrap up. In April I read 32 books so I split my wrap up into two separate videos and now we're here to do part two and talk about the rest of the books. There are content warnings in the description below as always with all the content warnings that I could think of while reading and let's get right down to the books. The first book I want to talk about is Hollowpox by Jessica Townsend and this is the third book in the Trials of Morrigan Crow series. I read this one for the Wonder Along that Sabine and I were hosting and I have a link to the live show where we discussed this one with Gavin from How to Train Your Gavin and Jade from Jaded Reader. Now the third book I don't want to tell you the synopsis of but I'll talk about the first book which is where Morrigan is a cursed child who is blamed for everything that goes wrong in her city and she has been cursed to die on a certain day but when that day comes around she gets swept away by Jupiter North to the world of Nevermore which is full of magic and whimsy. So in this third book we are getting a lot more darker themes and a lot of themes that relate to our pandemic and what has been happening to us recently so it was very much on the nose. I did like this one but I will have to say I liked it less than book two and more than book one. I liked the development of characters and how their relationships are developing and I do like some of the themes that it tackles. I think it does a very good job of tackling those themes but in a magical kind of fairy tale way when it comes to racism, discrimination and also people's actions during a pandemic. I'll just leave it at that. But at the same time I feel like this book had so much darkness in it and it lost some of the balance of darkness and whimsy that I was really much enjoying in Wander Along where I found it had the perfect balance of happy magical whimsy moments but then also enough serious discussion with a lot of depth in there. So because it lost some of that it kind of lost some of my love for the book but overall I think it was a good fantasy read. It deals with a lot. I'm not the biggest fan of what it's doing in terms of the villain narrative and I can't really talk about that without mentioning spoilers but I will if you want to talk about it in the description box down below if you've read this book already but I'm very much intrigued in seeing where it's going to go next and I will definitely be reading the next book in this series once it comes out. I read Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi and this one is about this little cafe where if you sit in a certain chair you can travel back in time. You've just got to make sure that you return and drink the coffee before the coffee gets cold and we follow four different stories about time travel and their experiences wanting to do so, why they want to do so and what happens if they do so in the end and I thought this book was really really good. I was not the biggest fan of the first story so I definitely recommend just pushing past that one and getting to the rest of them where I think the story really starts to hit home and have a bit more of an effect and I really liked how it wasn't just one short story then the next then the next then the next they all kind of weave together in a way that is very wholesome I love the coffee setting and how it's kind of all set in this one place but still so much happens and so much is experienced I think it did a very good job of showing very realistic full characters even though there were quite a few of them and all of their interactions were lovely to read about and the things that it touches on thematically and the experiences that they have were all very emotional and all very heartwarming. I feel like the end message that it brings across was just a very wholesome one and it just pulled on me. I really enjoyed reading this one and I really really recommend it. Up next we have Beloved by Toni Morrison and this one is definitely a new favourite from me. I buddy read this one with Lena from Lena Rees and she also really really liked this one and in this one we're following some runaway slaves who have now set up this new life but in this new life they are haunted by a ghost of a dead baby and that ghost is beloved and it's about what happens with these characters interacting with each other, living in this house where they've been haunted and... <sighs> How can I describe this book? So much happens. This is such an emotionally heavy 
book and it's very masterfully written. I think the thing that strikes me the most about this book is how we are following these slaves who have gained their freedom by running away, by becoming free however they've chosen to do so, but at the same time they are not free. They are emotionally burdened by the trauma that they faced in the past and you can see how that trauma is holding them down but you can also see how simultaneously they so much want to move forwards and I think with trauma this is very very valid and this is a very true experience and it was amazing how it was written. It kind of flits back and forth between the present day of this story and also the past and at first it can seem quite confusing how it does this but actually I really like how it quickly and swiftly transitions between the past and present because it goes to show how wrapped up the past and present is with each other so tightly interwoven. All of the characters, every single character you meet is so whole, so developed, so real. None of them are entirely innocent, none of them are entirely guilty and all of them have had experiences and I appreciated hearing from all of these characters. I liked how in the different perspectives they felt very different from one another and even if somebody's character motivations was harmful to another character I could definitely understand. I could definitely see where they were coming from especially when it comes to how their trauma is contributing to the actions that they make in the present day. The imagery, oh my gosh, don't even talk to me about the imagery. The imagery in this book was absolutely beautiful. She uses symbols, she uses beautiful language. Everything about this book was fantastic. And the ending was the perfect place to end. What more can I say to get you to read this book? It is everything and more absolutely my favourite Toni Morrison I've read yet. I listened to The Confessions by Jesse Burton on script and there's a link down below if you like some free days of listening, 60 free days. I really really enjoyed this novel so in this one we follow this girl whose mother, she hasn't known her mother throughout her whole life but then her dad tells her that her mother used to be very well connected to this famous author called Constance and she decides that she's going to do her very best to get into contact with this famous reclusive author who hasn't written a book in many many years and this one is a very character driven story. You've got to be a character driven kind of reader because if you look at the plot overall not much happens except within the character's development of emotions and the character's development of their personalities and I liked how it did the two timelines. We've got the past and what happened in the past running alongside the present and what is happening in the now and I liked the way those two timelines reflected each other so you could make some connections between them but also I liked two storylines both felt distinct and different from each other We've definitely got lots of characters who are in relationships that I want to say are kind of abusive but also are just not pleasant. People are not happy in the relationships that they're in and it's about these characters working through that, coming to understand that and also the consequences of that because I feel like when you have relationships break down there can definitely be collateral damage and consequences and we definitely get to see that here too. Motherhood is very much a big theme in this one. You can tell from the synopsis as she's looking for her mother who she's never been able to meet but it was also more prominent and important in ways that I didn't expect and I really enjoyed reading about them. I really enjoyed seeing where the motherhood storyline went and I feel like it brings up some very interesting discussions particularly around the ending. I will say that in terms of most of the storyline, most of it is fairly predictable. I could see where it was going to go but I was here for the journey. I was here for seeing how the characters were going to get there. And yeah, I think it was written very well, very in-depth character analysis and I really will definitely be reading more by Jessie Burton. She knows how to bring characters to life. Now we've got to talk about Binti. So I read the short story Binti Sacred Fire, I read the second book Binti Home and I read the third and final book Binti The Night Masquerade. And it's going to be hard to talk about these books individually because I did read those back to back. But the first book follows Binti who is tribal, she comes from a tribe and she gets accepted into a university that is very prestigious and very hard to get into, you have to be very smart. And she uses some of her tribal practices to do the treeing that they find very important at the university and she is told by her family that she shouldn't go but she sneaks away and goes anyway and along the way something very significant happens and it's about how Binti deals with what happened 
on the journey. But the story goes and it goes and it goes from there. So I'm just going to talk about these books collectively, especially the last two. I feel like the second one deals a lot with the trauma and consequences of what has happened in the second book, especially in terms of her relationship to her family because she defies them to go to the university. We've also got a lot of alien characters in this series and I think Nnedi Okorafor does a wonderful job of making these alien characters truly seem alien and different from the human race. I feel like a lot of authors don't manage to captivate the alienness of aliens very well but Okorafor has definitely done it and gone above and beyond in this book. The second one also deals a lot with identity. Binti has developed so much and her identity is not just tied to the place that she was born anymore, kind of like the international kids that you've got these days who are biracial or who have you know multiple identities and lived in multiple places Binti has exactly the same and she's kind of processing this and seeing where she fits in and where she doesn't fit in in certain identity groups that she has and it was nice to be in that journey with her as she was figuring things out but at the same time Binti's also become a symbol for a lot of conflicts that happen in this world and the way that she deals with them Binti is a queen for first of all dealing with them but it's definitely a lot for her to take on and you get to see that happen throughout this book and then we move on to the third book and I just want to say I love the third book a lot the beginning is very very confusing Binti is again processing a lot of things and she's got her trauma to deal with and she's got her identity crisis going on so Binti is juggling all of that but a lot is happening in terms of plot action and I think it was very suspenseful I didn't see where anything was gonna go so I was always surprised with what was ever was happening we meet a new character in the second book and they get more of a prominent focus in the third book and I really 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 like that character and also Binti's interactions with that character. I think the friendships and the relationships that are formed in this series overall are just so strong and so beautiful and each of those relationships is different because most of them are with a different kind of alien creature so you can see the positives and the downsides of those relationships and there's a lot of complexity because some of those relationships are evolved around her trauma so it's a lot for her to deal with but this series it's just so good the plot is good the characters are good the relationships are good and the thematic development of identity is some of the best that I've ever read so you've definitely got to read this Afrofuturist novel you will not be disappointed the ending left me very very satisfied mm, new favorite series I read another play which was A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams and in this one we follow our main character who is used to the high life but now she's going to visit her sister who lives a bit of the low life and it's not exactly what she was expecting when she rocks up and her sister's husband is definitely not what she was expecting and the sister's husband just keeps pushing the boundaries of her expectations to a place where they're going to have a lot of difficulty getting along. This book was very very interesting i feel like it very much focuses on the idea of reality and also fantasy of what you expect reality to be and what it is and what it isn't and i don't think like the book really focuses on our main character's perception of reality and her own dis disillusionment but i also think there are some other characters in this book who are equally as disillusioned and the way these two storylines and these two characters who are living in a sugar-coated world it's quite emotional to see that happening I feel like all of the characters were very well fleshed out and I loved hearing from all of them just to see how they reacted to different events in this book but also to see some of the commentary that it's doing on class but also on sexism and misogyny I think this was a very good play tackled it seems very well brought across its points with characters very well very very good. I read Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs by Caitlin Doughty and I really enjoyed reading this non-fiction book. Caitlin Doughty is a mortician and she answers questions that children have given her about death. It's really a question answers book. It's that straightforward but I learned so much reading this one and also enjoyed learning about death and dead bodies and grief. Very very impressive. I do want to say this focuses a lot more on you know death deadness and facts rather than the psychology of grief and such it touches on it a little bit because of course those two topics are woven together but it's very much focused on death dead 
processes and things like that. There was so much that I didn't know and it was mind-blowing to discover. It's also got some illustrations in it which I share about in one of the vlogs and I like these illustrations. I think it added another layer to the story and it was also not too scary because we're talking about death and dead and all of that taboo but the illustrations are not too frightening to frighten off anyone. I think this would be a good one to read with kids because she is answering their questions but I also liked reading it as an adult and it definitely had me thinking about some things that I wouldn't have thought about but I, I'm glad I did such as you know the most environmentally friendly way to dispose of your body is cremation more environmentally friendly than burial and which is the most environmentally friendly option but then also in terms of history and also in terms of what might come in the future when it comes to dead bodies it was all really really interesting and really really good I just absorbed so much of the information fun way to learn. We have The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman and this is a collection of three of her stories. So actually in this one you've got The Yellow Wallpaper, you've got Old Waters I believe and also The Rocking Chair and The Yellow Wallpaper and The Rocking Chair are very similar stories. They're focused on a singular object, they're haunting, they're creepy but they're also dealing with a very complex relationship. In one of them it's marriage and another one it's a friendship and I really love The Yellow Wallpaper. It's one of my favourite short stories but this collection in whole ended up being a new favourite for me because I loved The Rocking chair as well, really liked what it did, I liked how scary it was and then the last one, Old Waters, had an unexpected ending that made me laugh and laugh and laugh and it was just an enjoyable read and so different from the other two that I like how it was included in this little black classic collection. I definitely need to read one of Charlotte Perkins Gilman's novels because I've just enjoyed all of the shorts that I've read from her so far. I read Song for a Whale by Lynn Kelly and I felt quite mediocre about this middle grade book. It's not own voices representation just to make that clear and we're following a deaf girl but it's not own voices representation just to make it clear but it is written by a sign language interpreter. And in this one we're following a deaf girl who learns about this whale whose whale song is not understood by any of the other whales and she has a talent for working with radios and sounds and she wants to try and create something that can help the whale be understood by other whales. And I struggled with our main character, she's not the most likeable one but also I sympathise with her. There's a lot about miscommunication in this one because a lot of people can't understand sign language and then therefore can't understand her, even people within her own family. But also people don't listen to her because of her disability, she experiences a lot of ableism in school. And we also have her grandmother who is grieving and a lot of people don't understand the grandmother's grief so there's that lack of communication and again we've also got the whale who can't be understood by other whales and while I sympathised with our main character because it's so, it must have been so frustrating for so many people to not understand her, to not be making the effort to understand her or listen to what she wants, I also find her to be quite hot-headed and single minded. She doesn't seem to really think about other people's emotions much, maybe because nobody ever thought about her own, and she does things that I think are quite dangerous and quite not something that a little girl should be doing and I don't think the book gives enough consequences for the choices that she makes and the things she does and in that regard I feel like you know children will be reading this, there needed to be a bit more discussion on the consequences of what she did for me to be very satisfied with this book. I also didn't realise it was going to talk about the whale so very much. You know in the synopsis it's all about her making the whale song and such but it really digs into that so much so that it lacks the time and focus on the family relationships that I would have wanted to see developed more and some of the character development that I wanted to see. I felt like that aspect of the storyline eclipsed what could have been very important to focus on as well or equally as much and I felt like I learned a lot from this book on some of the do's and don'ts of deaf culture which was nice and I think a lot of children could value and lots of parents could have good discussions with their children of these kind of things but in terms of readability and enjoyment it just wasn't a favourite for me because I couldn't connect to the character, didn't really like her but in terms of deaf representation and learning a bit more about deaf culture I do think this book has value, also has a beautiful cover, you know that increases its value. I read Just In Case by by Meg Rosoff which is one of the oldest books on my TBR so I'm glad I finally read it and in this one we follow David and David 
one day has an epiphany and believes that fate is out to kill him and fate really has his number up. So he decides he's going to change his whole identity and personality so that fate cannot catch him out. And this book is so weird and it's so strange and it's so unlike anything I've read before. The way that it does points of view is interesting. We've got fate having a point of view. We've got David and also I guess Justin once he's changed his name and also a few other characters but I also felt a bit iffy about the romance in this one. I'm not saying that it paints the romance in a positive light or anything, but there's quite a bit of an age gap between the characters in terms of the romance. And also one of the characters in this one is just truly horrible. And I feel like for a lot of the book, it doesn't focus on how horrible the character is, but I feel like by the end of it, maybe it does. There's also a character, Peter, who's the best friend, and he is a joy. He is the best character in this book. I really liked him, how easygoing he was, but also how accepting of David he was. I just don't know what this book wanted me to take from it. I just don't understand. The ending was quite abrupt. It just stopped, and it wasn't like an open ending where it leaves you thinking afterwards. It was just this is the end of the book, even though I felt like more could have happened and more could have been discussed. And in terms of the message with fate, I'm not sure if it was... I'm not sure what the point was. Like, what was the message you wanted me to get after reading this? What was the, the outcome? What was the finish? And I didn't feel that. I just didn't get anything. And it just left me feeling like, well, that's done. That's the end of the story. So I don't think this was a brilliant book, but I wouldn't say it was a bad book either. It was a strange experience. Love, Hate and Other Filters by Samira Ahmed and this one is own voices representation for the Indian Muslim representation. However, it was not very good Indian Muslim representation but I've also had a lot of Indian reviewers tell me that they DNF this book once I mentioned it on Instagram because of how much bigotry the main character had and also I, I can find the particular Muslim own voices review that I also found that really helped me shape my opinions on the representation as I am not Indian or Muslim myself. But in this one we follow our main character who really wants to go to film school and is very much interested in film but at the same time she's trying to figure out her love life. Her parents really want her to find the person that she's going to be with forever and at the same time also a terrorist attack happens and all Muslims are feeling their repercussions of it. Now first of all I want to say that this book has a huge love triangle in it and the love triangle takes up a good 75% of the story so if you're going into this one expecting it to delve into the Islamophobia, racism discussion, that doesn't happen until the very end of the book and while the discussion on that is good and is worthwhile I felt like that was going to be more of the book than what it really was and most of it was just this love triangle that I didn't really like because one of the members of the love triangle already had a partner so it was kind of like is this cheating? Is this not? It's very borderline and it was very very uncomfortable to read and as well as that our Indian Muslim main character is not a practicing Muslim, that's okay to read that representation, but she seems to hate everything about Muslim culture and the Muslim experience and she seems to hate everything about Indian culture and the Indian experience other than the food, that seems to be the only aspect of the culture that she appreciates and as well as that she kind of talks down on anybody who seems to subscribe to or enjoy Indian culture which I find a bit judgmental and hypocritical of her and then as well as that there's this whole storyline going on with the parents and what the parents expect from her and what she wants and I appreciate seeing that discussion but in the end I don't really feel like it was resolved I don't really feel like it had a conclusive ending to that discussion and I appreciate that in real life maybe people don't get conclusive endings to those kind of discussions between child and parent but at the same time I felt like for this book that was the most interesting aspect of it and then it was just cut off and cut short so yeah I was not a really big fan of the love triangle how it split its discussion its representation and where it went with the only storyline I was invested in so overall I did not like this contemporary. I read a poetry collection and that was The Stone Age by Jen Hadfield and this one is a poetry collection that's very much grounded in imagery and image. We've got a lot of imagery to do with the wild landscape of Jen's Shetfield home 
I really liked how grounded it was in a certain place. It's also got a bit of unique formatting at some points. Again, in all of my vlogs I do flip throughs of unique formatting or images so that you can get a closer look. And I really like this poetry. I think it did a good job of being rounded. It touches on neurodiversity. You've got to really look into the literary devices to get the effect of this poetry collection. So I think if you're someone who's like a beginner into poetry or who likes more straightforward poetry, this might not be the one for you, but it was the one for me I really did enjoy it. I feel like this poet uses hyphens more than I personally like but that is definitely a personal matter and I would really recommend this collection. So I buddy read with Sophie from Redhead Reading A Man Lay Dead by Nio Marsh. This is golden age crime fiction and this is the first one in the Inspector Allen series and it's set during a murder game. These characters all meet in a house to play a murder game but during the murder game a murder actually happens. And I really really enjoyed reading this murder mystery. I felt like Inspector Allen was a brilliant detective. He's not like other detectives as I described in my vlog because he truly doesn't want to be working on murder cases. He just wants to just do his detective job and now that he's doing murder cases he just wants to do it best he can and find out who committed the crime. He does lend into theatricality a little bit but he tries to avoid it. I also like Nigel who is the main character we follow in this book during the mystery. I thought he was just such a nice chap and so genuine and he grows in confidence over the course of the book too. So we've got some very nice characters and as for the mystery it was really good. I couldn't guess who done it or how they'd done it and I liked seeing how it all pieced together but we do get all of the clues beforehand so you could piece it together if you're more of a detective than me. So this was a really good murder mystery and I'm looking forward to reading more of the books in this series. And then last but not least I listened to the audiobook of all of this is true by Ligia de Penaflor on audiobook and this one follows a group of friends who are big fans of an author. They fangirl about the author completely and they get to know this author in person. However, the author has written something truly scandalous and because of that a crime also happens and it's about getting down to the truth of the matter, what really happened and who is to blame. I did not like this book. I feel like overall I just I didn't like it. I think the characters in this one are incredibly annoying and they stay annoying all the way through and they don't really develop that much but more so it's about getting to see the truth of the matter and that's where this book has moments of shining because it is a very interesting topic to discuss. I don't think I've read anything that discusses this whatsoever but it is something that has happened in real life and you know it could happen again, who even knows? And I appreciated seeing the ways that people reacted to what had happened because I feel like when this event occurred in real life people reacted in very similar ways so it was very truthful to that. It has mixed media format and that was nice to experience in the audiobook. The ending is a bit of a moral ambiguity kind of ending so you can think about it and think do you agree with the characters? Do you disagree with the characters? That's always nice when you can think about a book afterwards but most of all my overall impact and feeling of this book was annoyed. I know I'm not going to reread it again. I just wish the storyline was written in a different way in in a way that didn't annoy me as much as this one did. That's all I can say. I feel like Annoying is not very good <laughs> review critique, but that is how I felt about it. <laughs> and there you have it. Those are all the books that I read in the month of April. It's quite a lot if you've watched both videos, but please let me know in the comments section down below what was your favourite read in the month of April because I've got quite a few of my favourite books in this half of the wrap up. I'll have a link to part one if you've missed out on that, but that's all I've got to say on these books. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more and don't forget to hit that notification bell to be updated every time I have a new video and you know what they say, onwards and upwards. Excelsior!